Good morning, Merry Christmas. Good morning. Jesus came and, and uh, who Jesus was, and now we want to talk about what he has to offer us. Now, sometimes at Christmas, um, I think a lot of at least young people, and maybe adults too, uh, think that it's kind of like rubbing a lamp for a genie and deciding what you want and hoping you get all those things that, that you desire and... and uh, but, but you know, the thing is, the crazy thing is, whatever you got for Christmas, like Christmas is over, and what if God said to you, what do you want that you didn't get for Christmas? I'll give you whatever you want. What would you say? See, I was thankful that uh, Three Oaks, I got a Corvette. Uh, the only problem was it's a two-seater, so... Will let their golf clubs. And besides that, it was a batch box, so it didn't really didn't really matter on that. But um, what would you say? Does Christmas have anything lasting to offer us? You know, you have to admit we have to be truthful about this. If we think about Christmas, it was pretty redneck, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, if we're going to be truthful, we, we sing about his birth like we did, like this great, wonderful, beautiful moment of all things. And I'm, I'm, I, I'm I, in fact, I know we take most of the Christmas story, not from the Bible, but from the carols that we sing about it. Because a lot of what's in the Christmas carols never deep. Well, you know where that was written? It was written in England. And... <laughs> And I'm guessing December 25th might have been a cold winter's night it was so deep. But Bethlehem is down on the Florida parallel, you know. And so I'm guessing it had been like Mike degrees. Yeah. And for Florida, you know, people think, oh, man, that is, that is freezing cold. Now, I remember one year in, in January when Willette's mom was in the hospital. We went down to Augusta and spent some time, spent a week there. Well, she was in the hospital, and um, I did something that I wrapped up, and you know, it's 65, 67 degrees out, and so when you think of that cold winter's night that was so deep, I don't think it was there, and we all have these great songs like Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and, and uh, you cannot show me in the Bible where angels sing. Luke the second said, the angels said, and uh, so maybe it got lost in translation somewhere along that way. But you, you think about maybe it was kind of a redneck Christmas. They lay born to a poor teenage mother. His first visitors to that was a group of shepherds, the ultimate dirty job of that day, because they were the looked down on upon those things. Uh, he grew up in a hick town. He his best friends were fishermen. And, uh, and... We want to look at the first circumstances of Christmas because it's rather surprising. Jesus, the King of Kings, that humble, dirty, unassuming first Christmas teaches us that Jesus is for all people. Uh, Bob, can you get that back? Uh... <laughs> See, you should have said something, Andrew. Well, I was going to, but I just didn't want to start. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can read. <laughs> well, I can read too, but it's easier. You know, we've been <clears throat> been over there. So, is there anything that Jesus offers that could be life changing or life giving? Anything that lasts beyond, you know, the third week of January that we receive as as a gift and. Uh, in the perspective. We've been over in First uh, Colossians, the first chapter, where we've looked at what Jesus, and then we looked at who Jesus was, and he expressed uh, the express uh, image of, G of God, that that's who he was. He's the head of the body, the church. And so this morning, we want to look at what Jesus has to offer us. You know, what, what's he, why Jesus came, who Jesus was, and the pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him and to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. 
Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, I'm reproached. If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established, steadfast, not moving away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and which was, I, Paul, that you thought of us. And the psalmist says that what were we in this universe that you thought of us, that we were even worthy, that you even blinked an eye at us, but you loved us, and you gave yourself for us. As we share together this morning, Father, help us understand uh, what that means personally to each and every one. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. One time, at one time, you were strangers to God, and your minds were at war with him. Your thoughts and actions were wrong, but Christ has brought you back to God by his death on the cross. In this way, Christ can bring you to God holy and pure and without blame. That's what God has done. That's what Jesus has done for us. He has pardoned us for his past. One time, I think my uh, cousin in Florida put out a put out a, a, a coffee mug that said, we were all naughty. <laughs> you know, and that's true. We're all naughty. We're all, uh, we all missed the mark. We all fell short of what God um, had, to, had put up there for us. And, uh, and uh, that, and to forgive us of those things. I don't know. If you're familiar, I did this uh, story, you know, I'm a history buff, so I use it every now and then. But in 1830, there was a man by the name of George Wilson. And George was a naughty guy. <laughs> he, uh, uh, George uh, and a buddy of his robbed a mail train. Okay? So they, they robbed this train, but they threatened the mailman. Have you ever thought about doing that? <laughs> you know... <laughs> You know what the punishment is for threatening a mailman? It was a capital crime. So it was a capital crime to threaten the mailman. So he and his buddy were judged because they somehow got President Andrew Jackson to issue a pardon. Now it didn't, it didn't pardon him from everything. It just pardoned him from being executed. He was still gonna to have to spend time in jail, but this would get that, and when they offered the pardon to him, George didn't take it. He, uh, he refused the pardon, and that through the, it ended up in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that for a pardon to be effective, it has to be accepted. And so, uh, early on, when I read this, and you can read, it, you, you can Google this, Google George Wilson, versus the United States or whatever. But what I found was that George's buddy, he didn't get a pardon, he'd already was executed. He was hung later in Philadelphia. Had a story about George Wilson saying that after 10 years, George was released from prison. So, you know, he either died or he did. <laughs> if it's on the internet, it must be true. If it's in the newspaper, we must figure it out but everything that had taken place. But the whole key was he was under the sentence of death. He was pardoned, but refused the pardon. And that's, you know, that's all of us. We were all under the sentence of death and God pardoned us. Offers you a pardon for your past, but you have to accept it. He's offered this for everybody in the world. Whosoever will may come. Whoever believes, that's his invitation. And so the pardon has been given. It's possible for your past to be pardoned, but you've got to accept the pardon and grace in accepting Jesus. You have to humble yourself before him and say, yes, that's one thing Jesus offers us that is lasting to eternity. The second thing is Jesus offers you a purpose for your life. So many people just go through life and have no clue what, what their purpose is. Uh, uh, Rick Warren 
I don't know how many books he sold, The Purpose Driven Life, but there are millions of them. The life, I'm hearing the first chapter of Colossians, we see it. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generation, but now has been manifest to his saints, to whom God will to make known what is the riches of his glory, this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing every man, teaching every man with all wisdom that's within me. So this is our purpose as a, as a believer in Jesus, as a disciple in Jesus Christ. It's pretty well, you know, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. People are only going to see Jesus living in our life. Your neighbors are only going to see him. Your coworkers are only going to see him in, in us. And so what is our purpose to proclaim him? You know, get them right. <laughs> that to admonish, uh, not just to admonish them, but to teach them with all wisdom. So our goal in this life is to present every person on the face of the earth complete in Jesus Christ. That's the goal of the church. That's our goal. That's our purpose. That's why we're here. Jesus offers you a purpose for your life to be his hands and feet in this community, to be his hands and feet in your neighborhood, to be his hands and feet in Jesus Christ. That uh, We want to go to heaven, but we want to take as many people with us as we can. That's, that's what Jesus offers us. He offers us a purpose. Living the Christian life can be tough sometimes. But notice what Paul says at the end. You're not doing this on your own. For this purpose, I labor, striving according to his power. His vessel, the power and the glory comes from God. We carry this message in just this <laughs> fragile body. But the power to change a heart and a life comes from God. And so we need to understand that. God offers uh, the Sidewalk Prophets uh, song, Come to the Table. That is just a great song. He invites everyone. Come to the table. We, we read, God the Father was pleased to have everything made perfect by Christ, his Son. Everything in heaven and on earth can come to God because of Christ's death on the cross. Christ talks about a lot when he talks about uh, the great table, uh, the banquet table at the wedding feast. He invites us to the table. Around the table, you know, we can, we can learn a lot of things about people. We can, we can uh, build better relationships around the table. Uh, in many countries, when you invite somebody to the table, you mean you're inviting them to be a part of your life, to, to be there, to build a relationship with what we have done. He loves us in spite of our sin, our weaknesses, and though we may feel unworthy, which we should, he invites us to come. Come to the table. Everyone. That's the picture of heaven. Come to the table. The invitation isn't just for right now. It's for in the future also. But he invites us to the house with lots and lots of room. A big, big table with lots and lots of food. That's, a, that's the invitation that Jesus gives us, but he offers us that place, um, a place that we can feel at home, a place that we're welcome, a place where we're loved. And that's what he offers. He offers us a pardon for our past, a purpose for our life, and a place at our table, at his table. God exempt himself from hardship of this life. He was born. And then he said, cave. He was born and laid in a feeding trough. You know, he didn't exempt himself. Uh, he did that. He grew up. And when some people wanted to follow him, he said, foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests. He would know. Hebrews tells us we don't have a high priest that can't uh, identify with us because he's been through everything we've been through. He's been there. He's done that. He's the way that we can follow. But he didn't do it. You know, said, well, you do this. I, I'm not, because he's been there. And we sometimes at this time of the year go through a lot. 
it doesn't bring happy memories for a lot of people. I've had four funerals in the last three weeks. You know, it doesn't bring happy memories. That's never a Christmas present people thought they were going to get. And so, but Jesus has been there. And what he offers us is that if you believe in me, you'll never die. What a great promise. We say it all the time. It's like a cliche, but we don't know what other people, how other people handle things, but Jesus does. He can walk up to Dave and say, Dave, I know what you're going through. I'm right here with you, man. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He knows what you're going through. No matter what you've done, he loves you. You can't be. He spent the first night of his life in a feeding trough, grew up the son of a carpenter in a hip town where somebody said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Because he wants to know, wants us to know just how deep his love is for us. He loves us. If we don't deserve it, he loves us. Keep it. But we need to re-gift it to someone else. And so the angels, when they came to the shepherds, they said, I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all people. A Savior has been born to you. He is Christ, the Lord. He offers you a purpose for your life. He offers you a place, this table. That's his invitation. And that's the invitation he gives each of us. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Let's pray. God, we're thankful that we can come and share together this day. You are a great, awesome, and mighty God. And we just give thanks for this in a place in your kingdom and, and to qualify us to be that because of your death on the cross. You came as, a, as God in the flesh, and we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten the Son of God, full of grace and truth. You came to offer us a great deal. His name.